Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Welcome. Welcome to those on Facebook Live. Uh, and let me be the first to say, Happy Engineers Week. What? Today begins Engineers Week, so all of us that wear the pocket protectors can do it with pride. So we're going to start this morning's Serve us off by standing and singing, Love Lifted Me. Let's stand while we sing. your neighbor sitting beside you this morning and then have a seat. What's that? Oh, yeah, plenty. Plenty. All right, slow, as everyone slowly and safely, slowly and safely makes their way back to their seats. Moment again to welcome you again to Manual Baptist Church on this fine February morning. It is a lovely day, and I believe it's going to be a lovely afternoon in the Kanawha Valley, and it is such a pleasure and delight to see each and every one of you out and about today. And Nancy, it is really good to see you today. Ms. Ms. Gass. And also, all of y'all out there on the internet, interwebs, watching whenever, wherever you may be tuning in, we welcome you and we love you and we're thankful you're with us. We have a wonderful congregation. It is a blessing. 
And as the weather appears to be warmer, we may be in for snow yet, I know, but just the same, I'm thinking spring, and spring means Easter. Easter is a wonderful time of year, and we get into everything that goes with it. It's just wonderful. Um, so a lot going on, a lot continually going on. A couple of highlights I do want to point out. Remember, continually we meet physical needs of food and clothing. We're working with Bream Memorial and the donation. You can see it when you come in. It always looks so good. Thank you, Amber, for leading that. Please remember to bring non-perishable clothing items that are listed for Bree Memorial, and we're also doing the Bags of Love. Thank you, EBC Quilting Ministry, for continuing that. There is a list of things and items that are needed. Also, to give you a reminder that Right Now Media, I hope you're using it and accessing great teaching tools and things we have out there. A couple things coming up, uh, convention-wide at least. There's the, This Friday is the Senior High Convention on the 24th, and next Friday is the ABM Annual Pray, men's Prayer Breakfast at Kanawha City Baptist for any of y'all who are interested in that. That said, I am going to pass over the mic to Pastor Bree. Hi, good morning to you all. I do want to highlight that next, not this Friday, but next Friday, the 3rd of uh, March, the youth will be having a concert of prayer, and you are invited to come and be a part. We have been studying prayer, and we have been following the, uh, the pattern of the acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, taking a week to look at each of those aspects. And then as we come to the end of our study on prayer, uh, of not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, on then that Friday, March 3rd, at 6.30 in the evening, we're going to have an interactive uh, time set up as a concert of prayer, and we would like you to come and join us as we somewhat celebrate what we've learned about prayer and participate in prayer through several interactive sites. And so we hope that you will be able to come and be a part of that evening. Again, it'll be at 6.30. And then the men's prayer breakfast that the AB men do for the state is then Saturday morning at Kanawha City Baptist. You should let us know by this Wednesday that you're planning to attend so we can get an account from our church. That would be very helpful. Uh, I want to introduce Dinah Graves to you. She is the executive director of the Bob Burdett Center. Uh, some of you may have met her if you've been in the building, but we wanted to have a chance for everyone to get to meet her. So, Dinah, would you come? Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come and to get to meet all of you, hopefully and to know each other's faces when we pass maybe in the hallway, at least now you know who this lady is who's walking through your building. I'm really grateful to be able to say thank you on behalf of the Bob Burdett Center. Um, we could not exist and operate to the extent that we do. We have four sites on the north and west sides of Charleston. We serve over 100 children. We could not do that if we were not housed within Emmanuel Baptist Church a beautiful facility and we're just so grateful that you allow us to partner with you to reach so many children who a lot of society considers to be unreachable. So I want to offer you my heartfelt thanks and sincere gratitude on behalf of the board and everyone who works at the Bob Burdett Center. So it's not just children that you're reaching, it's also people that you're helping to employ in, in the fact that we're here in your facility. We have money to employ people and to give them gainful work and meaningful work, just all different all different things that you're doing. And every time you give to the church, not only is that our Christian duty, we're supporting the ministry and we're reaching people to Jesus, but you're also helping change the lives of children who in many, many cases, they have no one else, they have no one who cares about them, sometimes not even their parents, but they're introduced and surrounded by people of faith every single day after school. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and I hope that you feel as good about it as you should. So thank you so much. much and as we prepare for worship I will be going to the 22nd Psalm as we approach Easter season it's a reminder that when our Savior was on the cross 
seconds. And I go all the way down to verse 22. And I will surely recount your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear Yahweh, praise him. All you seed of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you seed of Israel. For he has not despised and he has not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in this for the celebration of the resurrection of Christ, Father, as we spring and a wonderful time of your Father, glory in your glory in your continual in your church that you built and maintained through all adversity of thousands of days that you heard our cries, and we thank you for the opportunity to have to publicly claim your publicly speak to your publicly out and to thank you God may continue to give us the strength may you give us the to empower your thank you for the opportunity In Christ Jesus name we Continue our worship and music this morning by standing and singing. I love to tell the story.
Tell me the story of Jesus. standing for the offertory. Pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly and gratefully give you thanks for the gift that you provided for us. Bless this time. We pray, Father, that you strengthen us and strengthen us. We pray, Father, that you thank you. Strengthen us to be cheerful and kingdom that you may be. Thank you for Christ Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you so much, ladies. Wonderful. We are in 1 Peter, which is near the end of the New Testament. It's the first of two letters that Peter wrote to the churches scattered in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. So I invite you to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter 3. 15 and 16. If you are able, if you would stand with me as we would read God's word together. 1 Peter chapter 3, picking up with verse 15. Peter writes, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. The Lord bless the reading and our hearing of the word today. Join me in a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, you're the one true living God, Holy Trinity. We thank you for the breath of life today. We thank you for this gift that you've given us that we can step through and walk through the courses of. And Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit walks with us and comes alongside us each step of the way. Lord, we thank you that you have orchestrated our steps to bring us together in this place here. We're in person and some by Zoom. And Lord, we pray that you would just allow this to be an opportunity in which you would speak your truth into each of our hearts. Lord, may we, like Mary, take that place at your feet and choose to focus our hearts and our minds and our eyes upon you for the next few moments. And may your spirit deliver to each of our hearts the message that we need to hear. Lord, help us not to race ahead to the events that we think will happen today or the days yet to unfold, and equally not to be caught in the yesterdays of life. But for these precious moments, Lord, be with us, guide us, speak to us your will and your plan. Lord, I pray you take these very simple words I have prepared. Permit them to be a means by which you speak into each of our hearts this day. I pray in the name of Christ. You may be seated. This is the first letter written by the Apostle Peter. When you look at Peter's life, he is such a dynamic, wonderful person. I love Peter. I don't know about you, but I love Peter. You know, he started out as Simon. He was a hard-working laborer, fisherman. He, along with his brother Andrew and his friend Zebedee and his sons James and John, were in commercial fishing together. They were out there every night except Sabbath, and they were working to bring in fish that they would then take to market to sell, and it's how they made their living. It's how they were able to support their families, and they had success. And it was that person, Simon, whom Jesus, walking along the Sea of Galilee that day, made a call. Andrew had already spent some time with Jesus and brought Peter to meet him. But on that day, as Jesus walked by, he called Peter and Andrew, and he called Zebedee's sons, James and John, to leave their nets behind and come and walk with him as his disciples. They were the most unlikely candidates for discipleship that anybody would choose. No rabbi in their right mind would pick someone like Simon. Because Simon was very short-fused and hot-tempered. See that in scripture? That's what I see. He acts before he thinks. He speaks before he thinks a thought through. He very quickly dives in and has to be saved. That's Peter. And yet, when Simon comes to Jesus, Jesus gives him that name Peter. And Peter means Petros, rock. I'll tell you, Simon is anything but stable and and a solid rock. But see, as Jesus calls him and gives him that name, it's not who Peter is, it's who Peter will be. As he allows God to bring the transformation in his life. And it's Peter, who's one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, who were with Jesus almost his entire ministry. There were times that the other nine disciples were not with the three in Jesus. 
but most of the times they were together. So he saw firsthand the teachings of Jesus. He saw the miracles of Jesus. He saw what Jesus did. He had witnessed it all. He was even there in the courtyard when Jesus was being tried by the Sanhedrin. And you remember? In the upper room, he said, I'll go to my death for you today. And when the slave girl says, Aren't you with him? Remember? And then after Jesus' resurrection, <laughs> Peter's struggling. He's struggling with who he is because he had been the leader of those 12 because he was so outgoing and so charismatic that the others followed him and he had kind of set the goal for each of them. When he had denied Jesus, it was this Peter who wants to go back what he used to do. Remember? He said to the others, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back out on the Sea of Galilee. He's going to go back and do something where he had success. And he gets skunked. He gets nothing. And that's where Jesus lovingly calls to him. And he jumps in and runs, swims to Jesus. And then goes and counts the fish. Because it's, it's awkward. You know, he's denied his Lord. And his Lord's there and he's alive. And it's none, not deniable. And, and it was there that Jesus said to Peter. Peter. My lamb. Peter. My sheep. Follow me. See, that's who wrote this letter. And he, he writes this letter later in life. He's been a leader of the early church. He's been out proclaiming the gospel message to the other Jews wherever he might go. And us Gentiles at times. But his focus was the Jews where Paul's focus was the Gentiles. And as Peter went about teaching and preaching, proclaiming the gospel, planting the good news, building the church... It's that Peter who had become that solid rock, who was careful to think before he spoke, who no longer just moved with his own urges and desires, but under the direction of the Holy Spirit. It's that Peter who pens these words. He pens them to a group of churches across modern-day Turkey, a place called Asia Minor. And there, those churches were in the midst of terrible persecution. They were churches that were suffering greatly under the hand of the Roman Caesar. They were being blamed for everything, and there was all sorts of, of cruelties that were being exerted upon the churches because they had been clearly delineated from Judaism as this not just sect of Judaism, but this whole new religion. There was great battles, orally and spiritually, that the, the Christians across Asia Minor were enduring. And Peter pens these letters. This is out of the first one. His intent in penning these letters is to encourage them. When you go through difficult times, when life throws its worst at you, it's very easy to become depressed, lonely, isolated. Right? It can happen. That's not where our strength is, is it? Our strength is in the Lord, Jesus Christ. Our strength is in the community that we worship and serve in. It's in the fellowship of one another. And it's that Peter pens these words to encourage the church, to be the church, especially in this time of great difficulty and struggle. And as he writes to those churches that are scattered across Asia Minor, he's writing to people who know that following Jesus costs a lot. They've lost family, they've lost position, they've lost wealth. They've faced physical abuse. Some have even been put to death for this faith to follow Jesus. They understand the reality of how real it is to say, I'm a Christian. They're not just words. It's confession from one's heart. That's who Peter's writing these words. Words of encouragement. Words that call them to have a hope as they face the persecution. 
a hope that's rooted in Jesus Christ, who's alive, making our hope alive. That no matter what comes, we can stand firm, knowing that we stand with our Redeemer, with our Lord, with our King. Stand with us. And so as he's writing this letter, he comes to this part, and he makes a powerful statement. Verse 15, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. In your hearts. This is about a commitment of one's life and will. Setting Christ apart means you make him priority. You give him literally the throne of your life. He becomes the one in charge. Well, I don't know about you, but that is directly in contradiction to myself. I don't know, maybe I'm confessing and I'm the only one here, but I like to be in charge. I like to decide where I'm going to go. And I like to decide what I'm going to do. You know? Am I alone in that? I mean, that, that seems to be our human condition. We want to have the say of what happens in life. But see, if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, see, Peter's the one who can talk. Because when he started following Jesus, he struggled with who was in charge. He battled with it. You can read it through the gospel accounts. Peter's constantly struggling and being challenged. Even when he gets it right at Caesarea Philippi and says, You are the Son of God. He turns right around and says, Jesus, Jesus, you can't go to the cross. And Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You remember? You know? He's the one that can say, This is what it means. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus, then we have to make the decision that he will have lordship in our life. It's not just that he's my savior, and so on Sunday mornings for an hour or two, we live a certain way. But it's every moment of every day, I'm following him. He's sitting on the throne. He's making the decisions of where I go and how I act and where I talk and when I don't talk. He's the one that takes control of every direction and goal of my life. And what I found so interesting is the goals I held when I was young, I still have them. They've just been tweaked in ways that I never thought possible. See, this is about him being the one that's in charge, the one that's king. And what Peter says, we must, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must set him as Lord. We must commit our life. I can't do it optionally. i got to step in. You know, if I had a great big wash tub here, and I tried to stand on the edge, what's going to happen? I'm going to be laying out there on the floor. Okay? It's going to flip me off. I can't stand. i got to be all in it, or I'm outside it. See, when we talk about setting Christ as Lord in our life, it means we're drawing a line and we're deciding at this moment and this time, from now on, I'm all in. I'm going to be radical about this. It's not just going to be when it's comfortable and easy and convenient, because that's what many people want their Christianity to be. It means I'm in even when it's not easy and when it's uncomfortable and when it may cost me. And especially when you consider who's hearing these words. There are believers who are literally losing all because they've chosen to follow this Jesus of Nazareth. We kind of miss it here in the comforts of the United States because our faith seldom costs us much. We might have a friend snub us for a little while. I don't think any of us had someone knock on our door in the middle of the night and drag us out to prison, right? It doesn't happen. But it does happen. It's what they were enduring. And so as Peter begins this statement that's of utmost importance for every believer, we must have Christ as Lord, which means we're making a commitment to a life, not just to an organization or to a group, but we are committed to now live redeemed through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to live that way, Guess what? 
we're going to stick out society like a little white piece of lint on black cloth. We're going to stick out. There's nowhere to hide. It's going to be all out there. And everyone's going to see it. And when they see us make the decision on Sunday morning at an ungodly hour of 8 o'clock to get out of bed to be at church at 9.30, everybody sleeps in on Sunday. That's a day off, right? For some people. Or, my goodness, you mean midweek? You're going to take and go to that place and spend an hour or longer? You mean that you're going to take and you're going to read this archaic book that was written long and long and long and long time ago and you're going to read it and you're going to accept it as truth? You mean that you're going to love people who don't like you? It, it means that you're going to identify with a group of imperfect people? It means that now, when you get extra change at the register, you're not just going to slide in your pocket and walk out and say, well, that's the store's fault. You're going to go back and try to make it right. Try that nowadays. Several years ago, Cindy wrote a check at Christmas time, made a big purchase, and the computer at the Walmart in Hurricane was having problems. And so we find out a month and a half later, the check never clears. And so we go back in and try to pay the, the bill. And you know what they said? It will cost us too much to figure it out. Merry Christmas. And I've had somebody else when I've had to correct something say, sure. See, if we're going to live this sold out, committed life to Christ, then the world is going to ask questions. Because when we start following Jesus, guess what? We are going to be contrary to the culture around us. Because the culture around us is about self being exalted, self being satisfied, self being glorified. That's today, folks. But if we follow Christ, he's exalted. He's glorified. He's in control. And so the world is going to ask a question. And what is it? A few of you are with me. What is it? Why? Why in the world do you live how you live? Why in the world are you giving up these goals and dreams and successes and wealth and fame to follow some person who lived 2,000 years ago? Why? Are you going to allow your life to be interrupted and redirected because of what a book said? Why are you not going to join us for the celebrations that we can't be a part of anymore? That was especially a problem in the first century. Why? Why do you call a person who has no relationship with you brother or sister? Yeah. Why do you even love them? Why? See, the world is waiting. Because when we choose the way of the cross, when we choose to set Christ as Lord in our lives, the world is going to shake its head and marvel and wonder. They're going to ask, why? You know what else they might just do? They might just try to make your life tough to see if you feel. Going through college, I had the wonderful privilege to pay my college tuition each year by working at the Will Island Power Station. I swept up coal dust. 40 plus hours a week. I'll probably die of some sort of lung disease. Because back in the 80s, they never even gave me a paper mask to wear. But I swept up all that organic arsenic all the time. All right? But I paid my bill. 
And I remember one guy there, because I was already pastor in a small church in Fairmont, and so I was driving every Sunday morning to Fairmont to preach at that church and stay through the day and do youth and drive back and then be back at the power plant at 6 o'clock Monday morning. And some of the guys were Christians, but many of them weren't. I had one guy particularly. And he made fun of me all the time. He'd make fun of me because during the 15-minute break, I was sitting out in the sun trying to get a little sun because I was on B floor and A floor most of the time. I didn't even see the light of day a lot of the days. And I'd have my little New Testament on my lunch bucket, and I'm reading it. And he'd make fun of me. Just constantly. And then he would do things like he'd open the side of the sandblaster and pull all the sand out on the floor and then call me to come clean it up. So I'm plant janitor. He did it more than once. Good thing that I swept around the turbans. Then I, the Lord, and I could have a lot of talks. They all thought I was insane because I would sing and I would talk to God while I was working because nobody could hear me. And the crushers are crushing the coal. Nobody can hear anything. And I was having a great time with the Lord. You know, you never know. Years later, when I was candidating for my last church position, which would have been now like 27 years ago, I went to a mutual church to preach for the Pope Committee here. When the service was over, guess who walked up? And his first words to me was, do you remember me? And I said, yeah. He said, the whole time we worked together, we talked about this Jesus. I thought you were crazy. And I watched all the times that you cleaned up the big messes I made for you. He never once said a word to me. God that was hired before you would curse me to the ground. Never said a word. You just cleaned it up. I'll be honest, folks. Lord, I had some conversations about that. But I didn't say anything to him. He said, I tried. Did you to swear? You wouldn't. He said, long after you left, you made me think. He ended up coming to know Jesus. It had been years since I had seen him. You never know. This is why it's so critical that when the world asks the question, why? We must have an answer prepared. It isn't enough just to think we'll know what to say when the time comes. The Holy Spirit does give us the words to say when we come before governors and judges but folks, we need to think through our walk. Because somebody, one of these days, is going to ask you, why? Why do you follow Jesus? Why do you claim the cross of Christ? Why are you willing to deny yourself the wonderful luxuries of life? Why? We need to think about that beforehand. That's what Peter says. We need to prepare an answer because we've thought that question through. And it comes back to setting our hearts, as, setting Christ apart in our hearts as Lord. Because listen, if I don't have him as Lord, if I haven't made him king, then it makes no sense. And when nobody's looking, you might not be faithful. But see, walking with Jesus is about a commitment of my life. To him, which means even if nobody sees, it's still my choice. Nobody sees me get up and read my Bible. At least in my house, I get where everybody else does. I'm not seen by anybody. Nobody sees those moments when you're down on your knees praying for God to unleash revival. It's not something everybody sees. That's not big public displays. It's in those moments when you get the extra $2.50 back from the register. You try to make it work. Because it's what we need as followers of Jesus. And we need to be ready to give an answer. You've got to do it with gentleness. Why does he say with gentleness? 
first off, because what we're going to tell the world is shocking. It's like grabbing 110, still alive. Sends a tingle through you. Okay? What we're going to tell them is going to be shocking to them. Because it is not what is the song of the world today. The world says you are the most important. Not Jesus. The world says you go get everything you can get rather than honor Christ. And so what we're about to tell them is going to shake them foundations. It's going to cause them agony. And when we speak truth, my friends, it stirs in the heart of those who are not in right relationship guilt. Because listen, everybody knows deep, 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 deep down Something's missing. That's why people chase all sorts of things to try to fill the void, the hole. Guess what? All the stuff of this world can fill it for time. But then the law of diminishing returns kicks in, and the next thing you know, it isn't enough. Because it wasn't. So we need to do it with gentleness because it's going to be revolutionary. It's going to be radical. It's going to be hard for them to grasp. So we need to do it with gentleness. That means that when I give my answer, I'm not going to take my Bible and all of its truth and start beating them over the head. It doesn't mean I'm going to scream at them in the face. It means I'm going to love them to death. And in those opportunities of loving them, I'm going to share with them the truth that God has made known to me. And it's only a piece. I don't have it all yet. I don't know about you. If you've got it all, please come see me because I'm still gathering. But he's going to use that. And in those moments of being in relationship and caring, we can share and speak the truth into their lives. Because if I run up to them and shake my finger in their fist, or shake my finger in their face, or maybe to their fist, and say to them, you're a wretched sinner going to hell, guess what? They already know that. Because they know something's not right. And something isn't complete. We need to have the answer ready and prepared so we can do it with gentleness. And with what? Respect. Because guess what? They may just laugh at you. That hurts your feelings. It hurts mine. Be honest. Tell somebody truth. It hurts when they laugh at you, call you silly, call you foolish, call you dumb. We need to share gentleness and with respect. And we must recognize this is about choice. And though we may eloquently share with them with great care the truth. They may very well say, for me. Do not that take that as a no to you, gospel. Because if we take it personally, the next thing you know is we're not as apt to try to come back and tell them again. That's why Paul says it must be with gentleness, with respect. Because guess what? You may have to go back. But in the process of going back over, 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 and over again, they have the chance to hear the life-giving news. There is a Savior. He's paid our sin debt. And as we share, we can share with a clear conscience, knowing that we have shared as God has called us to. We are called to share the gospel, right? We are called to sow the seed. Who does the work? The Lord does. <laughs> Paul says, I planted, Peter watered, somebody else. <laughs> the 
can do it with a clear conscience, knowing before God we have done everything we can to make the evidence of the truth. Guess what? I can't make a mistake. That's part of the respect piece. I have to allow people sometimes to make an answer that's not what I want. Especially when they're near my dear to my heart, I want them with all my heart to know what I know because I want them to spend eternity with me and not in hell. I have a clear conscience, I've done all I can. It also opens the door for me to be able to come back again. Speak the truth over again. And again. And again. Because I know I'm doing this for Christ. And what am I telling them? <laughs> telling them my testimony. This is what God has done for me. You know what? That's your good answer. There's people today that need to hear your story. They need to hear your testimony of how God found you. The Bucky Myers sin. Might not use those terms, they might not understand. And he's reached down in that muck and he's lifted you up and he's placed you on solid ground. And then he's cleansed you from top to bottom and inside and out. And he's placed a joy there that you never, ever, ever knew before. Nothing ever gave joy like that. Nothing ever gave that peace that our relationship with Christ gives. Nothing has ever touched us like Christ and transformed who we are, that we're radically different from who we were. I once was, dot, 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 but now I am, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, that's what I get to tell them. That's the story I get to tell. And your story is the answer Peter's talking about. That answer we prepared. We've thought through what Christ has done. We become energized and excited and inspired when we consider where I was and where I am now. And it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of what we looked at last week, that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It reminds us of the privileged call we have that as we walk through life, make disciples. That's what he's called us to do. It's where we have the opportunity to be an ambassador for God. That he's given us the privilege to be able to speak to the world what we personally know. It's your story. It's your answer. And guess what? Tell our story. Tell our stories. The world is desperately in need. Hear your story. Because guess what? Each and every one of us has a unique story. Every one of us. Unique. Why? Because there's someone out there that needs to hear your story. They don't have to hear somebody else's story. They need to hear your story. They don't need to hear Don's story. They need to hear your story. I'm convinced of that. And part of the fact is we want just the pastor and the deacons to go win people to Jesus. Well, guess what? We only win the ones who need to hear our story. They need to hear ours. So the call is to go out throughout the highways and byways of life. To go out as you walk through whatever this week holds. As you walk each step to do so, redeeming the moment and the time so that people can hear that life-giving message of what Christ has done for us. To hear the message that we'll begin Lent to lead up to at Easter to celebrate his sacrifice for us. To be able to tell them the story that gives life, gives it eternal life. Tell our story. The story of Christ's love for us. To say to the world, Jesus Christ has touched He's touched me. He's touched me. Friends, that's what we need to tell them. Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, next Sunday, right on, as long as you have breath. You need to hear the story 
how Jesus changed you. Morning. Brothers and sisters, we need to be telling our story. I am convinced. I don't know if you are, but I am convinced that is the message our world needs. They need to hear a message of hope. Not hope in what we think might happen, but hope in what has already taken place that confirms the It's Jesus. I'm convinced that we need to see God move in mighty and powerful ways. And I believe this too. We have to be prepared. So brothers and sisters, set Christ apart. Be ready, prepare the answer for the wise and live that life sharing that good news gentle, respectful so that when the world may at some point stand before God will have nothing to say but good about as you exalted him if we've let the world pull us away from that mission I invite you today to realign your life refresh, recommit, revive your life. That's my invitation, brothers and sisters. This morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's good news. He changes. He wants this very moment to come and to touch you and transform your life. And it will be scary. And it will take you on an adventure you never, ever expected. You will find as you journey for the richness of God. I want to invite you today to accept Jesus as Savior. To let him have that position as king. You've not asked Jesus in your heart today. Today. He's inviting you. Don't hope for tomorrow. Live in this moment. He's calling you. Come receive. You're not a member of our church family. See, we're called to do this in community. That's important. We're called to be the community of faith. We're called to be the family of God. We're called to be the Emmanuel Baptist Church. We want you to be a part and share with us in the joys and the excitement and all that God is doing. If you're not a member, we want to invite you to make yourself a member. God is speaking. Hear his voice. Follow his voice. Receive his touch. Father, we thank you so much for this morning and for the richness of your word. I thank you for each one that's here and each one that's watching online. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would just open our hearts and let us see what you Allow us, Lord, to see as those who walk with you, if there's places we need to surrender or refresh, align ourselves with you. So today. Lord, if there is a need because you haven't yet come in and there's still a void and a, a vacancy that you can't see. May we surrender to you and allow you to come and fill perfectly. May today be the day, your day of salvation. Lord, if you're calling someone to be a part of our church family, or may today be the day they step out and make that request known. Lord, that we might enter together, worship and service. May we be able, ready prepared to share our story. We ask in Jesus' name.
I want to encourage you this week, tell your story. Don't try to make it perfect. Because guess what? Perfect stories don't normally seem to ring true. Tell your story. Share with someone this week what Christ has done for you. We begin Lent this week. And next Sunday, we're going to be looking at a series of five services where we're going to look at Jesus' life in different places where people put their faith in him. I hope that you'll come and be a part of our times of study together as we move through Lent starting next Sunday. And I pray that we look forward to what Easter will hold. Sunday that we can invite those neighbors and friends that are not yet in the Ark of Salvation to come. That they might hear the message of a Redeemer who loves them. That they might come to know him and join us as part of the family of God. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for each one here today. It is not by accident you brought us together here in person and in and Lord, I pray that you would just allow us to go forth this week. May our hearts be filled with overflowing that we're just, <laughs> just come out and it'll bubble over and flow into the lives of those we encounter. It will tell them our story of how you've redeemed us, how our lives are changed because we've yielded to you and received your gift of salvation. Lord, today, allow us a chance to tell someone about your love. Thank you, and we pray in your name.